Colgate University. For videos, podcasts, and other digital resources, visit colgate.edu slash colgateconversations. The following interview is one of a series of Colgate Conversations on World Affairs, hosted by Colgate University President Jeffrey Herbst. Welcome to this Colgate University Conversation on World Affairs. I am President Jeffrey Herbst, and with me in the studio today is P Professor Joy Gordon, Professor of Philosophy at Fairfield University. In her book, Invisible War, The United States and the Iraq Sanctions, Professor Gordon examines how the U.S. shaped the Iraq sanctions from 1990 to 2003. And she gives us a stark picture of the humanitarian consequences and political stalemate that resulted. Professor Gordon is at Colgate to deliver the fourth annual Sharer Memorial Lecture hosted by Colgate's Peace and Conflict Studies program. Welcome, Joy. Pleasure to be here. You note in your book that the Iraq sanctions were the most comprehensive ever instituted by the international community. Almost a decade later, what's your overall summary of their efficacy and consequences? Well, certainly it was, they were catastrophic, and we're seeing the continuing consequences of that to this day. They, uh, they entailed the destruction of the, uh, the, or the inability of Iraq to rebuild its infrastructure after the massive bombing campaign of the Persian Gulf War of 1991, um, and the decimation of Iraq's health care system, education system, and on and on. So we're certainly seeing that now in a lost generation. Essentially what happened was that Iraq, Iraq's infrastructure was bombed, water, sewage, treatment plants, electrical generators, uh, roads, bridges, telecommunications towers were all really just flattened in 1991. The sanctions then prevented Iraq from rebuilding. The consequences was that Iraq was, in the words of the, United, um, of the Secretary General's uh, envoy, uh, reduced to a pre-apocalyptic pre state. He also describes it as a pre-industrial condition. A and then Iraq was essentially kept in that condition for over a decade. So as we see now, Iraq struggled to recover from that and the chaos and the turbulence that continue to this day uh, are in part because of the massive flight of uh, professionals, the collapse of the education system, the inability of Iraq to um, reconstruct or recover in any significant way. Um, and also uh, just the, the um, as a kind of a statement to the Arab world, here is what the United Nations is willing to do, the extent to which it's willing to go to destroy a country in the Arab world, um, and, and a sense that there is just no limit in some cases on the human damage that the UN Security Council is willing to, to do. Could, they, could the sanctions have been done differently? Uh, or were they an inappropriate tool for the political goals? Well, uh, so let's talk for a second about the political goals. The, the apparent, the stated goals of the UN Security Council sanctions had to do with uh, Iraq withdrawing from Kuwait after its invasion in the summer of 1990 and partial disarmament. The goals of the United States were regime change. And because of something called the reverse veto, uh, it became possible for the U.S.'s goal to be the one that was determinative. The reverse veto happens when uh, a measure is imposed and it does not have an ending date built in. It doesn't have a sunset clause. So it takes another resolution, a second resolution, to end that measure. But any of the five permanent members can then veto that resolution to terminate. So it then becomes possible for one member alone to maintain something for which it no longer has the support on the Security Council. It could not get it imposed again, but that any one member of the, of the permanent members can then keep that condition in place uh, indefinitely. And the U.S. was very clear. Uh, the Iraq Liberation Act of 1998, which President Bill Clinton signed, numerous statements by every administration, the first Bush administration, both Clinton administrations and the second Bush administrations, again and again and again said very explicitly, we will keep these measures in place until Saddam Hussein is gone. So that created, for one thing, a disincentive for Iraq to comply. 
why should they comply with the apparent demands of the Security Council, the stated demands of the Security Council, when the sanctions would never be lifted just by their compliance? They would only be lifted at the, at the termination of a regime that was famous for its, its inflexibility, for its, above all, its commitment to its own survival. Was there a theory of the sanctions that the Security Council or the United States believe that if there was enough, for instance, humanitarian harm, that this would cause popular pressure against the regime? Or what was the theory by which sanctions were supposed to achieve the means either of the Security Council or what you describe as the United States? Well, certainly a, a common theory in the use of sanctions is to cause enough suffering on the part of the population as a whole that they will then rise up and overthrow or in some fashion remove the leadership. But of course, that's if you think about it, that's, a, uh, that's really an appalling idea. If you say to someone, we are going to cause you so much suffering that even with an autocratic state, even with a horribly violent, repressive, vindictive state, we will cause you to be so desperate that you will do anything to get rid of it because what we are doing to you is even worse. Um, you know, Kant, the, the philosopher Immanuel Kant, talks about the categorical imperative. What's, a, what's an ethical principle that is absolute? And one, one formulation of it that he gives is uh, always treat humanity uh, uh, never, as, never solely as a means, uh, but always as an end in itself. And so if you think about that, uh, it means don't use human beings as mere tools. Don't reduce them to being nothing but instruments for some other purpose. And in this case, that theory of sanctions is exactly that. It's saying we are reducing an entire human population to being nothing but a device, a mechanism that if we, if we cause it enough pain, it will rise up and do our bidding. When you've talked with uh, diplomats, UN, US, other governments, about the Iraq sanctions in retrospect, what do they say to you when when you bring up these issues and the overall humanitarian cost? They have a few ways that they think, that they respond to this that are, it's often the very, the very same pattern, but it's, it's a, f a few things that are always said. One is, um, it's Saddam's fault. Um, if Saddam had not invaded Kuwait, we wouldn't have done this. If Saddam had disarmed the way we insisted, this wouldn't have happened. If Saddam had not built palaces, then that money could have gone to his people. Um, and it's a way of, uh, of insisting that we are not the agents. We are not the moral agents who, in fact, impose this. Um, but of course, uh, we are. And when, um, when we impose measures that it becomes impossible, that, that are so extreme that it is not possible for the Iraqi government, however benign it might have, it might be, to, to respond, then, then that is our doing. So in the case of Iraq, uh, Iraq's GDP dropped from about $60 billion a year to about $13 billion a year. It loses three quarters of its economy. Uh, and then that continues for 13 years. So whatever money uh, Saddam had squirreled away in his account in Switzerland or something, that's not enough to make up for the loss of three quarters of a nation's economy. If you look at the, uh, the kickbacks from the oil for food program, of which there were some, and the, the smuggling, the illicit trade that went on on the side, uh, the, the most, um, the largest uh, credible estimates are that over uh, 12, 13 years, that came to a total of, I don't know, 10 or $12 billion, which sounds like it's a lot of money. But when your economy has dropped from 60 billion to a year to 13 billion a year, a total of 10 or 12 billion dollars over 13 years is trivial. It means the GDP could have gone maybe from 13 billion to 14 billion. It looks to me, after looking at this really thoroughly, like there is nothing that the Iraqi government could have done that would have made a significant impact at all on the population.
And uh, I don't. I want to be very clear. I'm not defending Saddam Hussein. I'm not saying that uh, the aggression into Kuwait was anything other than aggression, or that Saddam Hussein was a decent human being, or that he was anything other than a dictator who was a very brutal man. But it is the case that the Iraqi government did a series of measures uh, that need to be acknowledged. They implemented a food rationing program immediately, and every UN agency, every NGO in Iraq for the next decade said that is the only reason Iraqis didn't, Iraq did not plunge into, uh, into a permanent famine. There were vaccination campaigns uh, for children. Um, there were a few measures like that. So it's not quite correct to say the Iraqi government did nothing. It looks to me like uh, whether out of benevolence for the people, I, maybe there was, maybe there wasn't, whether it was in response to the political demands of remaining in power, let's say that was what the motivating factor was. But the bottom line was, it looks to me like the Iraqi government was scrambling to do what it could for its people, regardless of the reason, and that it was simply impossible once a country is reduced, literally, from a modern industrialized nation to a pre-industrialized state and kept in that condition there is not that much that the state can do. In retrospect, what might you have suggested to have been done instead of this sanctions regime? Well, um, it would, uh, instead of the sanctions well, regime. In, or instead of, let's say. Instead of. Well, what I can tell you was there was no shortage of uh, reform attempts um, starting very early on. By 94, certainly there were very thorough reports done by consultants saying the humanitarian damage is off the charts. You need to allow, um, you need to allow in basic humanitarian goods or you're going to have uh, essentially a massacre on your hands. There were reports quarterly from UN agencies. There were reports of everything imaginable from UN agencies about uh, the vitamin deficiencies that were showing up, the malnutrition, uh, women with anemia, um, life expectancy uh, contracting, um, shortages of food, shortages of fuel, um, again and again and again, and tying these, these, uh, these particular forms of suffering precisely to particular aspects of the sanctions. So what I came across in my work were uh, lists and they were the list of the contracts for humanitarian goods that were being blocked. And it would identify which country was blocking them. And then I could take the, the contract number from those lists and go look at a different set of documents that were produced by the UN's humanitarian agencies, where they don't say who's blocking them. They just say, you know, these 18 contracts related to water treatment plants are absolutely critical for providing potable water to this population of two million people. We are desperate. You, if we don't have these, child mortality is going to continue to spike. There will continue to be epidemics of cholera, typhoid, and dysentery. And then, if you have those two sets of documents, it's very clear what the direct responsibility is. The U.S. had no shortage of documentation of every sort saying, your decision to block the generator needed to run this water treatment plant is resulting in hundreds of thousands of people being forced to drink filthy water every day. So it was very clear what could have been done differently. And it was equally clear that there was no political will to do that. Much to talk about. Our time is limited. But going to the present and to the future, we see another Middle Eastern country, uh, which is being sanctioned by the international community, Iran. Um, set of demands, different, of course. Every country and every instance is different. But from your study of Iraq, what would you advise policymakers uh, in current discussions about Iran and attempts to change the behavior of that regime? Well, with Iran, um, what I think is very interesting is what that tells us about uh, targeted sanctions, sometimes called smart sanctions. Because certainly what happened as a result of the sanction on, on Iraq was a very strong movement toward narrowing the sanctions, 
hitting the leadership only, hitting only um, the bad goods, uh, stopping weapons from arriving and that sort of thing. Iran, the sanctions on Iran are absolutely being touted as, as an example of smart sanctions. Uh, and if you look at the Security Council resolutions, um, they say uh, they, they could not look better. They say, um, we, uh, we call upon nations or we decide, we require nations to uh, take efforts to block cargo where they have information that gives them reasonable grounds to believe that the cargo will contain materials related to ballistic missiles or um, proliferate nuclear uh, proliferation sensitive materials. So if you look at it, you think, well, that's great. That's exactly what we want to do. But here's the thing that's interesting. So then you have to say, well, so why is it then that in fact uh, no bank in the U.S. can make any transaction to any bank in Iran in any form, directly or indirectly? if the only thing that's being blocked are financial transactions relating to nuclear missiles or to ballistic missiles. Why is it that all cargo is blocked, that no marine insurer or reinsurer can provide insurance to any cargo ship of any sort carrying anything to or from Iran? Why is it that the U.S. and the EU have uh, flatly embargoed all purchases of Iranian oil sales? And the answer is that there is this surpassingly vague language in the Security Council sanction, uh, resolutions. And it says, in addition to this great language about there shall be no technology transfers of goods related to nuclear weapons or ballistic missiles, no um, financial transactions related to those, and so on. They also say, we ask the states to exercise vigilance in their dealings with the Iranian banking system. We ask the states to engage in enhanced monitoring. So those two things, exercise vigilance and enhanced monitoring, what do those mean? The answer is they mean absolutely anything you want them to mean. So what the US and to a lesser extent the EU, but alongside of also uh, Canada, Australia, and a few other countries then do is they say, ah, we have been asked by the Security Council to exercise vigilance. Therefore, here's how we will exercise vigilance. It is illegal for any bank that has any presence in the U.S. in any form to engage in any transaction of any sort, directly or indirectly, with any other bank that has anything to do with Iran. So consequently, you have this odd situation where, for example, Iranian Americans in the U.S are theoretically permitted to send remittances to family members in Iran, but there is no bank through which they can do it. Um, you, it's possible in principle to send packages. The U.S. Postal Service will not do it. But the thing that's really devastating, it, each of these is systemic. It's the banking system, the shipping system, and the energy sector. And if you look in particular at the financial system. So I'll give you a quick anecdote. There's an Iranian um, academic in the US who's a friend of mine. He's, uh, he's here under the Scholars at Risk program. He's here completely legally. There's no question about that. He goes to a bank, Capital One Bank, and he opens a checking account. As soon as they find out he's Iranian, they, they simply close out the account. And he says, why? I'm here legally. Here's my papers. And they say, you know, we just aren't going to explain that. TD Bank in Canada just canceled thousands of accounts of Canadian Iranians. And the answer is, if you look at what's happened to in half a dozen prosecutions against banks by the U.S. Treasury Department in, in this year, in the last eight months, half a dozen have paid penalties on the order of half a billion dollars each for transactions for countries with, the, which, with which the US, uh, on which the U.S. has sanctions. ING Bank, a Dutch bank in June, paid $639 million for transactions with Iran and Cuba and a couple of other countries. No bank in its right mind wants to risk that. So they will err on the side of presumptively denying any transaction of any sort that has any Iranian near it. 
uh, there was an incident in New York recently where the Apple store refused to sell someone an iPhone because he was speaking Persian. So is that racial profiling? Well, the thing that's interesting is if that individual had somehow bought an iPhone and given it to someone maybe who had some relative who was in the Revolutionary Guard, and you can imagine Apple imagining this possibility, then is Apple going to be prosecuted? Is Apple going to find itself paying half a billion dollars? No company in their right mind will risk that. So then there's this chilling effect that essentially functions at an entirely additional level of sanctions. And the result of all of these things, the shipping system, the banking system, technology transfer, energy sector, is that the sanctions are, I haven't mapped it out exactly, but as far as I can tell, almost identical in magnitude to the sanctions on Iraq. So we say we have smart sanctions now. If you look at these Security Council resolutions, that's what they look like. And they are devastating, they're indiscriminate, they're disproportionate, and I would say they're indefensible. Joy, much more to talk about. Our time is up, but thank you so much not only for this discussion, but for visiting us uh, today and giving this important lecture tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.